Um, yesterday I was with a few colleagues in Munich on the Automatica uh, trade fair for automation and in particular for robots. And it was quite fun. I've never seen so many huge cookers and their friends uh, so tightly gathered together in six large halls. It was really interesting seeing these robots. And, but we in particular looked for the smaller ones, like that size, which are suitable for service robotics. Um, and I decided that it's even more fun to do mathematics. <laughs> Because, I mean, it, it gets boring seeing all this hardware standing around and also seeing that most of this hardware is quite thump. Huh? Uh, so we haven't seen many exhibits uh, showing really good intelligent robots. And we also discovered that what we do over there in the cave building in our labs is is among the best what you can see in intelligent robotics. Yeah? So, I mean, that's really satisfying seeing that we with our small group uh, do something really good. I mean, we saw a project from Munich. In this project, there are 100 researchers working on intelligent robots. Of course, they do have much more expensive hardware. They had the PR2 robot, which costs 500,000 euros, and we cannot afford this. The robot we have costs 25,000 altogether. Um, but this guy, uh, which they showed, is not at all more intelligent than what we built here. That was quite satisfying, and my message to you is, this is the really interesting part in robotics, but you need decent mathematics to understand this. And that's about what we do today here. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, this is the point where we stopped uh, on Monday, yes. So, we did um, numerical integration. Um, with this simple trapezoidal rule. I think we don't have to repeat this because it's really, really basic and easy. Yeah? Um, but the interesting point is that we can improve the accuracy of our approximate integral without doing any extra computations. That's the important point. Yeah? Um, so what we did is we calculate the trapezoidal formula for a step size of h. Uh, and then we get an approximation. And this approximation has some approximation error, delta t of h. And we know that this approximation error uh, decreases quadratically as the step size h goes to zero. And that's important. With this knowledge, we can, uh, we can improve the accuracy without any extra computational effort. So we don't have to evaluate our function f on any extra points. That's very important. We have it with the accuracy of h, and then what we do is we um, evaluate the trapezoidal rule um, on the double step size. And on double step size, you don't need any extra computations. Look. If this is our h, then uh, for, for uh, 2h, 
we need these points but we already computed them so there is no, no extra work to do with no extra work we get a much better accuracy so if we combine these two then we end up with this new approximation for the integral which is much better and that's what we have seen here so this is the more general view on the whole thing so we do have some approximation formula capital F in order to approximate this value A0 huh? um, and uh, we need to have um, a Taylor expansion of this approximation function I mean actually it, it doesn't need to be a Taylor series we need to have a power series for, for our approximation and the zeroth order term corresponds to the exact value huh? and here come the error terms so this is the first order term for the error and this is the next higher order and so on huh? and the powers here P and R and so on they are relevant um, for this Richardson extrapolation scheme so now we, we look at our result with a fixed step size h and we look at the result with a multiple of this step size h so here in I mean uh, what we did first we used q equal 2 but we can use any multiple q huh? um, yeah we could even use a q which is not um, which is not an integer but that wouldn't be a good idea because if q is an integer like 2 or 3 then you can reuse the already calculated function values but if q is 2.5 then you would need this point and that's not a good idea so of course you should use integer q's um, and then we get this formula I mean this is I, this, uh, we get this trivially from this by replacing h with q uh, times h and now from these two equations we eliminate a 0 and solve it uh, for a 1 Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, we eliminate a1 and solve it for a0 because a0 is the exact value we want to know. Yeah. And why do we eliminate a1? Because uh, if we eliminate this term, then we eliminate this first order error term. With the trapezoidal rule, we have an error going with h power p and in order to improve our approximation we eliminate this term and then we have a better approximation because then the error goes with h power r to zero and then we get a much better approximation that's the idea and that's why from these two equations we eliminate this term huh? and uh, the result is this formula okay and in this formula you see that of course we need f of h here and here and we need f of q times h yeah, yeah. and of course we need q and p and then we can get our better approximation and we can repeat this when we have our better approximation we can on this new approximation um, do the same thing again apply the same formula again and that's then the repeated Richardson extrapolation you see this formula here is exactly the same 
with the only difference that we use fk after step number k and recursively compute fk plus 1. Um, if we do this recursively a couple of times, then of course in our series expansion for the approximation formula we need more terms. Because with every new iteration here we get a better approxim approximation. So in iteration 0 we have this accuracy after one step this, after two this and so on. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, and I guess this is where we stopped on Monday, did we? Um, and now we apply this formula to the numerical integration. Huh? Um, and for numerical integration, I mean what we proved is that this first error term decreases quadratically with the step size h. What we did not prove is that the next term is not h power 3, it is h power 4 and then to the 6th power and so on. So we only have the even powers of h in this expansion. And with this knowledge we can now apply repeated Richardson extrapolation. We will use q equal 2. I mean that's what people most of the time do. Um, because then you can easily reuse uh, the already calculated values. Um, okay, and t1 of h is uh, the trapezoidal result. And now we, we just recursively apply this formula and in the denominator we have q, which is 2, to the power of uh, pi, which are the exponents here. And you see these exponents, they are the even numbers, so we have 2k as the exponents. Huh? And delta k here is what we have seen, tk of h minus tk of 2h. Uh, so delta k is a shorthand for the difference between the two approximations. Uh. Okay, and now we apply this scheme to this integral. The definite integral from 0 to point 0.8 of sine of x divided by x. Yeah. Okay, and we start here in this tabular. Look, here we have different h's. h equal point 0.8. Um, so h equal point 0.8. Let's, let's look at the picture. So we have, let's say, point 0.8 here. So this uh, about here is pi half. Um, so let's look the sine function. The sine function goes like that. It has its first maximum here. Huh? Um, and now the sine of x divided by x. How does this look like? What would you say?
how does it start for x equals 0? Yes, for x equals 0, it's undefined. But what about the limit? x towards 0 uh, of sine x over x. What is this? It is 1, yes. It is 1, so it starts right here. I mean, it's not defined for x equals 0. Huh? But for the integral, that doesn't actually matter because it's only one point. And so it is a quantity of measure 0 for the integral that doesn't matter. So it starts here. Um, and it starts like constant, yeah? somehow like that. Yeah? Why? Because the sign, the approximation of the sign for small x is equal to x. So we have x about x divided by x. Yeah? And then does it increase or decrease? What? It decreases. It decreases. Why? Because x grows faster than the Yes, sign. thank you. Because the sign uh, increases slower than x. I mean, x would be something like that. Okay. So it decreases somehow like that. Huh? So suppose it would look like this. And then this is our integral. Um, oh, sorry, the integral only goes to here. It ends here. Huh? Um, so what we can immediately see from this picture, and that's what you should do all the time, we get an estimate for our result. And we see, of course, the result is smaller than this rectangle. And what is the size of this rectangle? The integral, it is 0.8. So the integral is smaller than 0.8. And what you see here, this is, I mean, this is the kind of exact result, 0.77. OK, um, and what does our trapezoidal rule do for h equal 0.8, that's the area we get. And you see we get an underestimation. That's this number here. And then we do it for 0.4, which gives us something like that, and so on. Okay, so these are the initial values for the different ages. Yeah? Okay, I mean this is of course our best approximation and these values here can easily be computed from having the function values with h equal 0.1. OK, yeah. And now, so that's important. Here we have the different step sizes. The smallest one and this twice and twice and twice again. And now we calculate the differences between the difference between these two, for example. This is delta 1. So the difference, which is 0.01 almost exactly 0 0.01 and then we divide this by 3 which is 0 0.00336. 
Why do we divide it by 3? We have seen it here. We divide it by 2 to the power 2k and k is equal to 1. 2 to the power 2 is 4 minus 1 is 3. Huh? And then for the next delta, for k equal 2, we have 2 to the power 4, which is 16 minus 1 is 15. And that's why here we have delta 2 divided by 15. Okay, but here in this column we have this delta divided by 3, then this delta divided by 3, then this divided by 3. Um, okay, these are the, the new deltas. And now let's go back to the formula. We take, no, we take, uh, these, these were the deltas divided, so it's this term. And now we take this term and add it to tk of h. And this gives us our new tk plus 1 of h. Let's look at it. Um, we take this result and add this number and then we get this. Let's look at this. 0, 0, 3. Yeah. 3, 3. So if we add this figure to this, we get this. And if we add these two, we get this. If we add these two, we get this. So this is now our new approximation. And now we repeat the whole thing. So we take delta 2, which is this difference, divided by 15. Let's look at it. The difference is 2 in this uh, decimal place. Divided by 15 is smaller than 1, yeah, around 1 maybe in this decimal place. Yeah. And it's that. Yeah. Okay, and here also the delta and then uh, we add these two and get this figure. Yeah, we add these two and get this. And now, delta 3 divided by 63, because it's now 2 to the power, what is it, 2k, um, 8, 2 power 8, minus 1. So it's 2 power 7, no, uh, sorry. What is it? Let's see. So it's, oh yes, uh, here we have 2 to the power 2k, and k is equal to 3, so we have 2 to the power 6, yeah, which is 64, minus 1 is 63. Okay, so we get uh, uh, the difference between these two divided by 63 is this, and now the sum of these two is this new result. This is the scheme for doing repeated Richardson extrapolation. Yeah, and now if we look at this result and we compare it to an even better approximation, which is this, then let's look. Uh, 7, 8, 5, 4, 8, 5. 7, 8, 5, 4, 8, 2. Okay, so we have now an accuracy of a difference of 3 in this decimal place, which is 10 power minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So the error here is 3 times 10 power minus 12. That's what we have here after three Richardson extrapolation steps. 10 power minus 12. What we had here without any Richardson extrapolation was an accuracy of, um, we have 2 here and 
one eight. So it's two times, it's two in this decimal place, uh, two, two times ten power minus one, two, three, four. Uh? So we gained eight decimal places from three Richard's next population steps. And remember, the computational effort for this is almost neglectable compared to this effort here, for this one number. Because all the function evaluations we needed here, we can reuse them for this. And I mean, these steps, that's trivial. I mean, that's really trivial. That's like application of this simple formula, which is uh, one exponentiation, one uh, subtraction, one division, and one addition. So we have one, two, three, four, four arithmetic operations times one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have 24 extra arithmetic operations. Just forget it. Huh? I mean, look, normally you would use a small h here. So this is maybe 1,000 function evaluations, which is way much more than these 24 arithmetic operations. So you, you get almost for free a much better, better accuracy for the integral. Okay, yeah, that's easy to implement and of course, I mean in the exercises you, you shall do this and of course also because it's, I mean this is numerical mathematics, you have to implement it. Okay, yeah. Um, and now, I mean, we could go into other formulas for numerical integration, which we do not uh, use yet, because we have something very good. Yeah? Um, but there are problems where these methods fail. Um, and such problems occur as soon as you do have high dimensional integration. I mean, what we did here was one dimensional integration. Huh? A function of one variable and the integral then is an area. But if you have a function of two variables, then the function is a surface and then the integral is what? It's a volume, yeah. It's the volume below the surface. Yeah? And if your function depends on three variables, then the integral is a four-dimensional volume. And the problem is the following. Look, if we do integration of one-dimensional functions, then this is the domain of our function. So we need a one-dimensional grid of points. If our function depends on two variables, then our domain is maybe a rectangle like this. And we have now to put a two-dimensional grid over this rectangle. And now, I mean, of course, it's, it's not really difficult to write down a formula for such a two-dimensional uh, trapezoidal rule. Yeah? So what then happens is that on each one of these square cells here, or rectangular cells, we just put um, a linear function on top of uh, such a, a prisma. Yeah? But, the, I mean, the real problem is that 
let's write time. The time for t or for calculating t of h and h now is this and this. Huh? It's a step size again of course. Now how does the time uh, depend on um, H, yes. Let's first talk about the one-dimensional trapezoidal rule. Maybe we should write that um, H is B minus A divided by N. Maybe this makes it easier. Huh? So we have A and B and N points. So we, yeah, we have n plus, actually n plus one points, x0 through xn. Huh? And then we have this formula, h is b minus a divided by n. Maybe it's easier to see how the time depends on n. Yes. Um, so maybe we should write uh, T1 of, and now let's put N here. Uh, T of N, it's a constant times N. Uh, so it, it grows linearly with N. So now, how about time of T two dimension of N? And now N is the number of grid points in one dimension. Quadratically. Quadratically. So we have C times N squared. And now in, in an arbitrary number of dimensions, time of T D with D dimensions of N is obviously c times n to the dth power. And this is ugly. Because our, our computational effort grows exponentially with the dimension. And that's as bad as it can be. So for high dimensional integ integrals, the effort for one application of the trapezoidal rule increases exponentially with the dimensionality. And that's why estimating high dimensional integrals is not an easy task. In particular, if you need small h. And I mean the h you need depends on your function. What can you say about the uh, trade-off between the function and h? Suppose you know much about the function. What could you then say? Let's start with uh, simple functions. Mm, let's take a linear function. Take a big H. We can take an H as big as we want. So we can take, actually, let's say we take n equal 1. We just make a linear approximation and it's perfect if the function is linear. 
and the more the function deviates from linear, the smaller our h has to be. Of course, I mean, look at something like that. Now, the h depends on the frequency of such oscillations. Yeah? Or let's, let's take the, the period length. Yeah? So, if this is the period length, let's call it pi, then what should we do? How, how should our h be? Even smaller. Even smaller, yes. So I would say h should be much smaller than a typical period of oscillations. Yeah? So the more structure our functions have, the smaller h has to be. Um, okay, so if we have multidimensional functions with a lot of nonlinear structure, then we need very small h, and then we are getting this problem. And this happens in many uh, application areas, some of which we have here. Let's start with meteor meteorology. Yeah? Uh, the weather forecast, I mean, what people do is they simulate a three-dimensional space. Actually, the space in which we live, the atmosphere. Yeah? And, I mean, actually they don't have to ca calculate integrals, it's even worse, they have to solve differential equations in the three-dimensional space. Uh, but for very simple differential equations, we can solve them by integration. Yeah? So then we would have to calculate a three-dimensional integral, and in meteorology, the um, these functions are quite nonlinear. So, of course, they want to use as high a resolution as possible. Um, for example, take Europe. Uh, they put a whole grid over Europe, and I mean, if you want to have a very exact weather forecast for Weingarten, then Weingarten should be one grid point. Huh? And the next grid point ideally would be Ravensburg and not Paris. Huh? Uh, otherwise you don't have an exact forecast. So they want to have very small grids and we do have the three-dimensional space, so we have a complexity of n power 3. And similar problems uh, occur in uh, hydrodynamics um, or, I mean, that should be not physics, it should be physics. <laughs> uh, oh, and it should be not static. Ah, that's actually interesting. It's not uh, static physics, it's statistical physics. Huh? And statistical physics happens in three-dimensional space. Imagine a gas volume like in this room and you want to simulate something going on in this three-dimensional space or in solid-state physics. Uh, it's also a three-dimensional space and then we need three-dimensional integrals. Um, road traffic simulation, I mean this is in a two-dimensional world but already then we have n power 2. Waiting queue systems. Okay, uh, again, uh, I mean, this is not a perfect translation. Uh, I guess in English this is called, in German it's Warteschlangensysteme, and in English it's queuing systems, I guess. Uh, um, uh, and, and here, yeah, we also have to um, calculate integrals. Yeah, but I, I don't know the details here. Um, and yeah, and now I show you two methods which are actually superior if you have to uh, calculate high dimensional integrals. Huh? Uh, what then, what people then use are randomized methods. Look, I mean we very often do have periodic functions. 
And we can see it in one dimension that the trapezoidal rule, if we have periodic functions, may not be a perfect idea. Um, yeah. Let's take such a periodic function. And now, if we put our h exactly at the maxima, then what the trapezoidal rule does is, is this. And it's not a good approximation. Yeah. So if, if this is our h, and then actually no Richards extrapolation will help us. Why would Richards extrapolation here not improve the result? <coughs> yeah, we, we have to use one more point. Because if I take 2h, then I get this integral, which is the same, basically. So it wouldn't improve the result. But here we see the idea. What we have to do is we have to break the symmetry. I mean, here the problem is that our, there is a coincidence between our step size and the frequency of the function. Huh? And in order to break this symmetry, it is a good idea to use some randomized algorithms. An algorithm that selects our points randomly. I mean, if you know these typical frequencies, then you would say, what we did down here, we would say h has to be much smaller than the frequency. But quite often you have no idea about the frequency. Look at weather forecast. Then there is no analytically computation, computable function. They are just data points and they are kind of randomly scattered in high dimensional space Nobody wants to really look at this high dimensional space. And even if you want, if the dimensionality is high enough, you can't. So we need an automatic method that breaks this symmetry. And the idea is to use random numbers. Because if you have good random numbers, they break any symmetry if they are uh, the randomness is good enough. Okay, and now let's look at two very simple methods. Method number one is the, we could call it the, the cannonball method or the shooting method. The idea is the following. Um, and I mean, I illustrate this for a one-dimensional integral, but it works for any higher dimensions too. So suppose this is our interval a, b and we have this function and we want to know the area under the function which is the integral on this interval a, b. And now what you do is the following. Um, you go out over to the sporting ground of the pH and there uh, we, you have this rectangular field and the length of the field uh, you scale the interval a b on the length of the field and then you draw a white line. I mean there are these machines you can walk around and draw this white line which is your function. And then you close the area such that no persons enter it and you, you walk one kilometer off and then you take a cannon and you shoot into the air and your cannonballs will land on this field 
or maybe in the surrounding area. And you shoot as many balls as you like. The more the better, like 1,000 shots. Yeah? And then what you do is, you, then you go back to the field and you count all the hits in the rectangle. Yeah? Number of hits inside the rectangle and then you count the number of hits below the curve here in this area and this ratio is the relative percentage of hits in the integral area and then you multiply this ratio by B times H so B is the width and H is the height and then you have an approximation for the area under the curve. Well, I mean, that's it. In one dimension, this is not superior to the uh, trapezoidal rule. But in high dimensions, this becomes at some point uh, better than the trapezoidal rule. But, and, and the point from which dimension on it's better depends on the structure of the function. Huh? If the function is quite smooth and well behaved, then maybe up to some like four or five dimensions, trapezoidal rule still is better. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I mean, this is just to show the idea. Huh? This method is not used in practice because it is actually quite inefficient. Yeah, so you would need a lot of shots in order to get a high accuracy. Um, but now let's look at method number two. Method number two is somewhat better and it is also somehow related to the trapezoidal rule. Um, yes, so we first look at the mean value theorem of integration, which is this equality. The integral, and, and also we look at it in one dimension. Um, but an, an, a similar variant holds for more dimensions too. In one dimension, the, uh, an integral over such a closed interval from a to b over f of x dx is equal to b minus a, the length of the interval, times some value m. And it's not surprising that this is called the mean value theorem of integration. Let's look at this picture. And we take A and B. And now this is our integral. And now we are looking for some mean value m such that this area plus this is equal to, let's take a different color, this and this. So if the orange areas together are the same as the yellow areas, then the width B minus H times the height M is equal to the integral. So it's, it's very intuitive, this mean value theorem. And there is some value m. We just don't know it. 
Um, yes. And now what we now do is we again we put a grid over our interval, a grid of points and estimate this mean value. And how can we estimate the mean value? Yeah, we take the simplest we can do, we take the arithmetic mean of the function values at all our grid points xi. So we take the arithmetic mean as an estimate for this mean value. So we replace m by this a, so then that's what we get as a formula. And that's, and that's our new integration formula. And this formula is kind of similar to the trapezoidal rule, um, but only kind of similar. I mean, what does this formula do? Let's look at it. We take the function value at the first point and then function value at the second point and at the third and let's take them random so here we have a smaller distance and then we have a higher distance and it's not a trapezoid that we cal calculate we actually use such a step function something like that um, Yes. Yeah, something like that. That's what we do. Um, so actually, the, I mean, the formula is even simpler than the trapezoidal formula, but the new thing is that we choose the points randomly. And I don't need to ask this question again because we already answered it. Why do we need to, do, to select the points randomly? Because we want to break any symmetry that the function has. Okay, yeah, and I don't go into um, the mathematical analysis at all here because this is not really trivial. Um, and this is because we select our points randomly. Uh? So then this uh, really involves serious statistics um, and we don't look at this. But I mean I, I gave you an exercise to test these two methods in calculating the area of the unit sphere in I don't remember, I guess two, three and four dimensions. Yeah? And you will see that as you increase the number of data points, the accuracy becomes better and better. Okay, yes. So, yeah, that's enough about numerical integration. Any questions left? Let's continue with numerical differentiation. Um, <coughs> yes, uh, maybe we start on the blackboard with an example. We start looking at the definition of the first derivative. So we have some function f of x and now in this point x we want to know the first derivative. And you know this picture. So we put the tangent to the function in this point, um, I mean that's what we want to have. We want to know 
the slope of the tangent in this point. And now what we do is we approximate the tangent by calculating this point which is f of x. And then we calculate some point f of x plus h. And now we take this triangle and the slope of this straight line is our approximation for the first derivative. And that's why um, f prime of x is defined as the limit for h towards zero of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Look, um, this length here is f of x plus h minus f of x. And this here is h. And the ratio of these two guys is the slope of this line. And, and of course, I mean, you see, this is not really good. We want to have this. But it's getting better if we decrease h. With very small h, this looks better. And that's why we have to take the limit for h towards zero, but of course what's not allowed is h equals zero. That's the definition of the first derivative. And now, in numerics, we want to estimate the first derivative of our function at some point. Normally, in let's say school or most of university mathematics, you, the function f is given by a formula, by a closed formula. Then what would you do to get the derivative at uh, f prime of x? What would you do? You wouldn't look at this definition. Yeah, you, you apply the rules and calculate the first derivative. And there is good news. If the derivative of the function exists, and only then you want to calculate it, if the derivative exists, and the formula is in closed form, then there is a deterministic algorithm to determine the first derivative. That's really good news. Um, maybe you cannot uh, really feel why, uh, how good this news is, but let me tell you the inverse of the derivative, which is the integral, there is no such algorithm. There is no general algorithm to de determine the integral of a function, the, uh, the indefinite integral. And if you can't get the indefinite integral, you, uh, you neither can get uh, a definite integral. But for the derivative, which is the opposite, there is an algorithm. That's very interesting. I mean, that's what in, in computer science, in cryptography, we call a one-way function. The one-way derivative is kind of trivial. It's easy. You can calculate it always. The other direction, integration, is in general impossible. Of course, there are particular functions, for example, polynomials, for which it's easy to get the integral. But there are other functions, for example, the normal distribution. For the normal distribution, 
there is no closed form indefinite integral. So for, for such functions you have to do it numerically huh? and you know already how to do it. But now the question is for differentiation we don't need numerics because there is this algorithm for exactly calculating the first derivative. Now why do we talk about numerical differentiation? Shall we skip this section and continue with the next? I mean, if there is no reason for this, then we skip it. Huh? So many times we don't have the formula, we just have points. In the mm. Many times we don't have the formula for f. Yes, that's right. When, when uh, don't we have the formula? Give me applications. Maybe we should ask somebody to give us the formula. I mean, maybe it's just a, a weird professor who doesn't give you the formula. Huh? In? In? Hydraulics? Where the Reynolds number there is the in, in the in the critical region where you have turbulent flow and yeah. It's the mixing of lamina and turbulent. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe in such an area. Um, I mean there you cannot describe the flow analytically with a formula. Huh? Um, yes, I mean this is an example. There is no formula. Nobody knows this formula. Huh? Uh, but yeah, but now the question is, I mean, how do you get your function? How do you get the function values? I mean, we don't have the derivative, but do we have the function values? Do we have them? By experiments, yes. I mean, you do. You make some measurements, and then you get some values and data points, and that's it. So you just have a table of your function, and that's it. And so from this table of function points, you, there is no chance to apply our symbolic rules. Huh? And now we have to do numerics. Okay. And what we do in numerics is quite simple. We just delete this. And that's nice, isn't it? Because you don't like these, these limits. Huh? You don't like infinitesimal analysis. And that's again why I, if I would invent the undergraduate mathematics, I would start with this and just delete the limit and say, OK, we just approximate the first derivative. We take some small h and get an approximation. And the smaller our h becomes, the better our approximation is. That's it. And you can see it in this picture. Um, so if the function is quite well behaved, which means if it is differentiable, then this gives you a good approximation. That's it. I mean, it's really trivial. <laughs> um, so here it is. That's what we do. But we can do better. We can do better, and now we maybe we look at this picture. I mean, this is what we do. We take, we want to know first derivative at this point a, and then we take a plus h, and we get this estimate. Um, but if we take a central difference, it's a so-called central or symmetric difference, we evaluate f at a plus h and at a minus h 
And then the triangle we get is defined by this line and yeah, like that. And at least for this example, of course, I mean, I chose a, a quite a good example. Uh, the symmetric difference is better because, look, this is the tangent and this is our approximation, which is much better than this one. Yeah? I mean, we, of course, we can select other examples where the uh, symmetric difference is worse. Let's take, for example, a function which looks like that. Huh? And then the, ah, oh, that's, uh, it doesn't actually fit on the screen. So if we take the symmetric difference here, we would get something like that. Um, but one can prove that the symmetric difference on average is better. Um, yes. Um, and here we get, I mean, I just give you the results, we don't prove it. Um, um, oh yes, actually we do prove it, we do prove it, yes. We do prove it for now first for the, uh, for the asymmetric difference. We look at the Taylor expansion of our function f in some point A. And then the Taylor expansion uh, gives f of A plus H is f of A plus first derivative at the point A times H plus 1 over 2 factorial second derivative times H squared then 3 factorial third derivative H third power. I mean that's what you really know from the Taylor expansion, um, we have 3 times the 3 here, 3 times the 2 here. Um, maybe you know the Taylor formula a little bit different. Um, I hope you all know it. If not, look into the script of last semester. Um, we know the Taylor formula in a form like f of x is equal to f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times x minus x0 divided by, what is it, uh, 1 plus f double prime of x0 times x minus x0 squared divided by 2 plus and so on. That's what you all know by heart. You, will, you would all have written it like that on the board. If not, you have to do something. That's essential for the examination. I can tell you. It's essential for all of mathematics. Okay, and this formula is a little bit different from that. And it's your task to derive this from this. It's really trivial. Do it as an exercise, and if you can't solve it, come back and ask. Okay, but what we see here, in, and that's quite nice, second derivative h squared, third derivative, third power. Okay, and now what we do is we, we put this f of a to the left hand side and divide the whole equation by h. This gives us this. And now this is nice. Why is it nice? Because this is our approximation for the first derivative. This is the asymmetric formula. And what's even nicer is that on the right hand side we have the first derivative of f plus all these error terms. So we have the full error expansion. And we can write down this theorem. 
if our function f is two times continuously differentiable, then the error of the asymmetric difference decreases linearly with h. So we have this formula. So our estimation is equal to the first derivative plus an error term which decreases linearly with h. This is the error term. I mean this is the leading term in the error expansion and we can neglect all these. But actually it's good to know how it continues here. Why is it good to know? Uh, yes, depending on how exact you want to approximate, that's true. But my question to you is, how can we get a more exact approximation? Because we uh, can approximate the error, we can expose um, uh, <coughs> Just like we did before in the Richardson extrapolation, yeah. we could... We can apply Richardson extrapolation exactly in the same way here. Let's look back at our Richardson extrapolation theorem. Here. We, we just apply this theorem. Look, I mean, that's why I formulated it very general here, because we do not only want to uh, apply this to integration, we also want to apply it to, uh, to differentiation. This is our approximation. It's this formula. This is the first derivative. And here comes all the Taylor terms. And what, you, what we have to look up is this, these exponents. And we know with the asymmetric difference formula, we have the powers 1, 2, 3, 4. So all natural numbers. So p1 is 1, p2 is 2, p3 is 3. And then we will use these p's, apply it m here, and that's it. Yeah. Um, Yes, and we, we, again also we have to select a Q. I mean most of the time people select Q equal 2 and then that's what we can do. And that's why it's helpful to know that all the powers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on occur here. Okay, yeah. And now we look at the central difference. We do the same thing on the central difference and we will see that we get a much better approximation. So, um, this is the formula. f of x plus h minus f of x minus h divided by 2h. Maybe we should look back at our picture. I mean, here it's called a instead of x, so we have a plus h, a minus h, the two function values, and of course the width now is 2h. That's why we have to divide by 2h. Yeah, here. Okay, and now we do the Taylor expansion of this function in the point a. And, I mean, this is what we already had. Huh? Yeah. And now, we, I mean, we take this formula for A minus H. So we replace H by, here in this, we replace, replace H by minus H. So here there is no difference, here we get a minus and here because it's a quadratic term we keep the plus. Then with this uh, third order term we get the minus again 
So what we see immediately is we have the positive sign on all the even terms and the negative sign on all the odd terms here in the second line. In the first line it's all positive. Okay, and I mean what, what to do next? We apply this formula. We take the difference, so we take this minus this and then divide it by 2h. And that's what we get. All the, um, all the even terms, let me see, yes, all the even terms they cancel out. Huh? So we will lose this term. But we get two times this term. But we now divide it by 2h. So we lose the 2 and this h cancels out. So we get f prime of a, which is uh, actually a good idea. And now you can see why it makes sense to use this formula. Because we get the first derivative here. And now what happens here? This cancels out, but this term, we get it twice, divided by 2h, and that's why we have h squared here. And from the, the fourth order term cancels out, from the fifth order term we get this, and so on. And if we stop here, then we can say this is equal to the first derivative plus an error which decreases quadratically. So we see that the central difference is much better an approximation than the asymmetric difference. And for our Richardson extrapolation we already know the powers here. And of course we will get even better approximation when we do Richardson extrapolation with the symmetric difference. Okay, yeah, and I mean here we have the corresponding theorem um, and now we look at an example. We now compute the central difference of the function 1 over x in x equal 1. And we all know that the exact uh, result is 1.0, uh, minus 1, minus 1. Yeah? Because, I mean, this is our picture and at x equal 1 the derivative is minus 1. Okay, and um, so we, um, yeah, we use the central difference with h equal 0.8. Maybe we should look at the picture here. So we take what, at 1.8 one function value and at 0 0.2 here the other function value and of course this approximation is not at all perfect. So the derivative we estimate is way too large and that's what we get. Minus 2.7 something. For h equal 0.4 it gets better and better and better and here we already have quite a good an approximation. And now we apply Richardson extrapolation. Yeah? Um, again, we have the powers in our uh, series expansion are only the even powers. It's the same as we had it with the trapezoidal rule. And that's why these deltas have to be divided by 3, 15, 63 and so on. 
Ja? Um, yes. So this del delta 1 is the difference between these two guys, which is, what is it, uh, one point um, five something divided by three is this. Okay, so, and I mean now I use two, two, two tables. This is the table for the deltas and now we calculate this new value by uh, adding this value to this. Yeah? And that's what we get. And so on. And we have this scheme and as you see we get a much better approximation here than we have it here. Yes. So, ah uh, yeah, here on the slide we can't see F6 of H, which is even better. Okay, yes. Um, and now let's look at a formula for the second derivative, which is something we also need quite often. Um, and I mean, that's quite easy. The second derivative is the first derivative of the first derivative. Yeah? Um, and so we take the central difference and apply it to the first derivative. So we take f prime of x plus h h half minus f prime of x minus h half. This gives us a central difference with a step size of h half. And now we have to divide it by 2 times h half, which is h. Okay, and now what we do is we use the central difference formula here for calculating the first derivative. And again, we use it with a step size of h half. So we take x plus h half plus h half, which is f of x plus h. And at this point minus h half which is f of x. Um, and we divide, we, of course we have to divide this by h and that's why from this h we get h squared here. And again this. Uh, this point plus h half gives f of x. This point minus, minus h half gives f of x minus h and again divided by h squared. And now you see we get minus 2 times f of x in the middle and these two terms and that's our approximation for the second derivative. Okay, yeah, and with similar methods, I don't do it here, one can show that the um, the error for the second derivative um, can be estimated like that. So this, so I mean this is our formula we know from here and this is equal to the second derivative plus the error terms which again involve only the even exponents of h. So for this second derivative we can now apply the same Richardson extrapolation scheme. Yes. Actually let's look at these coefficients. So we have uh, one here and but, but this is the first error term. We have two divided by four factorial plus and here 2 divided by 6 factorial. This was different um, here. Look, we had a different coefficient here and here and here. The exponents were the same, but they don't matter. These constants, they don't matter. So we can apply exactly the same Richardson extrapolation scheme 
because the only thing we need is the exponents and they are the same. Okay, yeah, and that's it uh, with uh, derivatives. So now you know how to numerically calculate integrals and uh, uh, derivatives. And next, no, not next week, the week after next week, we will talk about numerical solutions of differential equations. And of course, I mean, you have a full week to work out on the exercises. And I mean, in the week after the vacation, then of course we will have an exercises session. And maybe already on Monday? Yes, why not? Yeah, let's have the next exercise session on the Monday after uh, Pfingstferien. Who knows what Pfingsten is in English? I, I ask myself. Who knows this? What is Pfingsten in English? Nobody? You have to learn it. You are now in Germany and... Uh... Okay, thank you.